for all the people out there with a dream that just wanna be seen. Yeah, my dreams bigger than the average. Welcome to episode 19 of the Be Seen podcast. Today we've got Jay Toyroff. This gentleman is a legendary stuntman. He's been in the biggest movies, doing the biggest parts. He's an actor and also a producer. Jay, thank you ever so much for coming on today with us. Really excited to speak with you. Yeah, appreciate it, man. Yeah, excited to be on. Ah, this is going to be fun. Jay, please share with us your journey. How did all this start? How did you become a stuntman in Hollywood? Getting into acting, producing? Where's the beginning for you? A football coach told me about a audition for a movie where they needed football players in Atlanta. And this was for a movie called We Are Marshall that had Matthew McConaughey in it. It's about the Marshall football team that died in a plane crash and killed a, a majority of the team besides the, I think, five or six freshmen that stayed behind because they were sick and didn't travel with the team. So I went to this casting call and there was probably three or four thousand guys that came out and they were only going to pick 22 to play parts in this movie and i got picked as one of the lucky 22 which is how my film career started and then i started doing all these football hits while filming but they didn't consider them stunts but they considered them playing football but they would give us bumps and which means they would say hey you take this gnarly hit we'll give you five hundred dollars or a thousand dollars and i was like okay yeah yeah i'll do it you know not knowing anything about the film industry at the time but i i did that and then i did my next film which was the blind side which is suddenly became news again <laughs> with michael orr uh <laughs> stating he never received any money from the film but that's how I started getting into stunts, which was in my second film, uh, In the Blind Side. And have you seen that movie? I haven't, no. I haven't. Oh, but you I'll need to watch it. It's good. So there's a, there's a scene in one of the football games in the movie where Michael, he, he's trying to learn the game. He's really horrible at it from the start, but he's like six foot eight, almost 300 pounds. So he's like a perfect beast to play football and they're just trying to teach him yep. and in this one game it finally clicks and i'm doubling one of my buddies actually and he pushes me down the field like 50 yards and he throws me over the fence that was like my stunt in the movie is you know my claim to fame in that in that movie and then obviously had some lines playing the linebacker as well but that's how i started to establish myself as a stuntman in hollywood and then from the blind side, and that was in 2008, my career just exploded. And as the, the movie industry in Atlanta exploded, and, you know, my next film was The Hunger Games, and then it just went on from there. I think I've been in over 130 film and TV show episodes. So, it's, And I've been in it for almost 17 years now. So it's been a long career. So in your films, another one you was in was Fast and Furious franchise? Correct. Fast 7, and then I did Fast 8. So I did those back to back. How was it to be on those films? And what did you have to do? Those films were fun. In high school, I loved street racing. So all the kids, when the first one came out, I was like, oh, I'm going to pimp out my car. And you know, I had this horrible, like, Mercury Cougar that my parents bought me. And I'm just, and I tried to make it all Fast and Furious. So it was pretty cool to be on a film that I really enjoyed watching when I was a freshman in high school and to be on it was pretty cool. I got to see Paul Walker before he passed on Furious 7. So I was able to meet him before he passed, which was really cool. But I drove a little bit on the, on both movies and I played a prisoner in the majority of the scenes in Fast 8, which they were they were trying to break the rock out of prison. <laughs> I think it was a rock and Jason Statham was in there. There. And we had that whole big prison brawl. I'm somewhere in there beating the hell out of someone. <laughs> you know, uh, The Rock, did you get to meet him? Was you in the same scene? Yes. Like, yeah. Yeah. I've met The Rock. He's really, he's a real nice guy. You know, the stunt coordinator on that show was uh, JJ Perry, which is a legend in our industry. And now he's a big time director. And yeah. He's real, real nice guy. He was like in Mortal Kombat, like the original Mortal Kombat. So he's. That's one cool of the best. Paul Walker, what was he like? He's very nice. Very nice guy. I think most of the actors I've been fortunate enough to work with um, directly have been pretty, 
pretty cool with stunt guys and stunt women. They know how hard of a job we have. And a lot of times we don't get credit for what we do in films because without stunts, the films would just suck. <laughs> like literally. So I think working with those actors, you know, they're, they're really cool towards us. So I, I can't say too many bad things about most actors I've worked with. Have you ever met your hero? I've actually had the pleasure of doubling one of my favorite actors um, being Jeff Daniels. Uh, I've always liked Jeff Daniels from Legend. Uh, Dumb and Dumber. There you go. You ever seen that movie? Of course. Who hasn't? What a <laughs> <laughs> but that guy is real cool. I, I doubled him in a show called American Rust. And yeah, it was it was an honor to work with him. He was he was very professional and really, really, really cool to watch him work. What's it like being close to these actors when they deliver their performances? What's it like? You know, because in the film, you see the final cut. You see the scene that worked. Uh, what's it like watching someone go through that process and trying to deliver that performance? Maybe not hitting it straight away. You know, how do they stay composed? How does the director, you know, offer his direction? What point do they step in? How, how does that process happen on set? Yeah, it's cool to see, you know, the, the the relationship with your lead actors and the director. And it depends on the director, you know, how they're, you know, approaching their actors or giving them direction. Some directors will get on a, we call it the, the voice of God. So they have a huge microphone and he'll just talk through it. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola is known for that. And I worked with him on his new movie that we just filmed in Atlanta, uh, Megalopolis. It was really cool to, to meet Francis and work with him and see you know the the original godfather man it's really cool to meet him and watch him direct those actors on that show and you know adam driver and uh, shia labeouf you know just watching them kind of take his direction it's, it's it's pretty cool how does he direct what were things that he did in his direction that you lot picked up on and thought okay that's interesting so he still, he, yeah, he still uses the same like old school monitor where he just watches playback and he has like this telephone that's always nearby. So if he needs to talk to someone, you have a direct line to him. And it, and it, I don't know who's on the other end or who he's talking to, but I thought that was just crazy. Cause I was like, I've never seen that before. I was like, that's nuts. And, you know, just being able to have a conversation with that guy was was really cool. And, you know, in some of the downtimes during the scenes, you know, we would have time to to talk to him. But most of the time he, he's just kind of doing his thing. I recall a moment where we were just waiting for camera to be adjusted and swapping lenses. And the, the stunt coordinator on that show is Buddy Joe Hooker, which... If you don't know who Buddy Joe Hooker is, that guy's way more of a legend than I'll ever be. <laughs> that guy is a very, very cool dude, and he's still at it. Like, there was a movie made about him, specifically about him, and it's called Hooper. If you've never watched Hooper, that movie is about Buddy Joe Hooker. Just a really cool guy. And Buddy's like, hey, Francis, you know, we're talking about being put in jail as stuntman because Buddy was like, I've been in jail, like, several times. I've had to get bailed out of jail so many times, and... I just remember Buddy asking Francis if he's ever been in jail. And Francis is like, I, in my life, have never been in jail. I've never even got a traffic ticket. What have you seen in, in your 17 years between, you know, a director that you're in awe of to a director that just, not calling it amateur, but there are levels. There's directors who are just, they just hit money every time. You know? Yeah. There's a lot of directors where it's like real amateur hour. <laughs> and, and Nick, when you talk to Nick, Definitely ask him about that because he's he'll he'll talk to you, he'll blab about it for a while on how how do these people get all this money to direct this film and I can't get money for my stuff. It's just funny because there's a lot of directors that really don't know how to direct. Like they're trying to set up the stunt scenes and it's like, will this work? Can we do this and can we do that? It's like, no, we can't do that. We have to bring them down to reality a lot. It's like we can do this. And it looks way better on camera since you're shooting it this way, but it's not going to look right if you shoot it how you're wanting to shoot it because either A, the hit's not going to read, or B, it's just going to look totally weird and fake. It's almost like you need to keep it as simple as possible. It's We say a lot in stunts, less is more. So don't try and over-exaggerate a hit or overcompensate on the cross if you're trying to hit someone but just keep it simple is what i've told a lot of directors that i've worked with you know setting up stunt sequences 
but there have been some directors where it was just really, really cool to, to watch them work. I'd, I'd have to ponder on which director that's really put me in awe that I was just like, this guy's really cool. I haven't been able to work with Quentin Tarantino yet. That is that is one of my really probably favorite directors. And, you know, David Fincher, Spielberg, you know, those big yeah. directors, you know. Go in. Yeah, Francis, I, I think, was probably up there because that guy's just a legend. Oh, um, he's on his own planet. He is with the Godfather. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that movie we just filmed, I mean, he financed the whole thing. It was like $100 million out of his own money. So he financed the whole project because I think no other studios wanted to touch it. They're like, this sounds stupid. We will never throw money into that. And he's just like, well, fuck it. I'll, I'll do it myself. And that's what he did. That's crazy that someone... <laughs> of Francis Ford Coppola's stature, he still can't get finance for a project with his portfolio. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, you would think. <laughs> you know, he's done some pretty old movies himself, but, you know, you think at this day of age, he comes at you with a script, you'd be a fool to say no, but there were some studios that said, hell no, never. That's mad. And just for the audience, just a bit of background of who Nick is. So... <laughs> Yeah, Nick, Nick Decay, he's a stunt guy as well. We met, man, almost 10, 12 years ago on the set of Hunger Games Catch a Fire in the wardrobe trailer. So we were getting fitted for our peacekeeper uniforms. I was a peacekeeper in all the Hunger Games. So you can't see me because my face is covered, but I'm in a lot of the scenes, you know, killing people, beating people up. And that's where I met Nick. And Nick is um, my business partner now. He's wanting to drift out of stunts. It, I think both in both him and I can agree that stunts was never our end game because we always wanted to do more yeah. and not work for the man, so to speak, and make our own stuff yes. um, and be filmmakers and, and be creative. And he'll take more of a director role. Like he's very, very interested in, in directing. That's all he wants to do is direct. And I'm more taking of an interest in producing because I like working with people. And I think creatively I can assist Nick with whatever needs to be done. So that's who Nick is. He's a stunt guy as well. Epic. And you've both done a documentary before. Correct. Um, it's called The Ark of Lilburn. You can actually watch it for free on Tubi, Voodoo. I think it's on Amazon, Apple. I think you can watch it on pretty much all the streamers. But that one was a fun documentary. It was about this guy in Lilburn, Georgia, which is on the outskirts of Atlanta, probably about 15 miles outside of Atlanta. And this guy built this steel company like 30 years ago from the ground up he built this boat but it's like not a boat that you would think that you would put in a lake or a fishing boat no this thing's like a dang ship i mean he built it in his shop in Lilburn, where there's like 200 miles to the nearest body of water where you could actually put this thing in and it's completely made out of steel it weighs like 90 tons so it's heavy and it's 50 feet long and it's 23 feet high and he's in the process of retiring so he's given this multi-million dollar steel company that he built from the ground up to his son and he wants his, to retire in tampa where he's living now but he wants his passion project or his midlife crisis in tampa so now they're trying to figure out how they're going to get it from lilburn to tampa Florida, but there's a problem. So when he built this thing, over time, his business grew. And as his business grew, they expanded on the property. So the boat started getting bigger. So they built the building around the boat. And now it's so big, they can't get it out without tearing half the building apart to get it out. And then they hired this Florida man with a ponytail trying to move the thing, who's a boat mover, who's never moved a boat. And they're just like, yeah, he's like, ah, I can do it. So and it was just a bunch of shenanigans that went on with it. And Turned out to be a really great documentary on this steel company and this owner of the company trying to let his son take the reins of the business. But, you know, his dad's just so like he doesn't give his son the credit ever in the film, which is is great to see on camera. And we documented it so well, like you kind of feel for the son and his name's Cole kind of feel for him and just is like, man, and you can relate to it, you know, from a father and son relationship. It just pours out on film and it. It turned out being a really great film. How do you take such a mass of content in such an enormous story about an enormous feat to get an enormous object from one place to the other? How do you approach it as a producer? How does Nick approach it also as a director? 
to be able to do the story justice, yeah. not over talk it, zoning on the value. How do you approach that? It was it was really hard because this was like Nick and I's first project that we raised our own capital for, which the uh, owner of the boat actually financed our film. So I had to sweet talk him into making this film and he ended up doing it. But creatively, we had to shoot this thing because it's going to be run and gun. Like we had to, not a huge movie crew that you would normally see on a big feature film, which a big feature film, you would have probably 300 plus crew. I mean, they're like mobile cities. I mean, it's like huge productions. Those are like multi-million dollar production. This one was only like $600,000 budget. So it wasn't very big, but we knew we had a crew of, I think 25 to 30 people at a time, which is really all we needed. And it was just a lot of running gunning. So we had three cameras set up. You know, we had one guy doing BTS plus just getting all fun stuff. And then we had two dedicated cameras. We had a steady cam and then we had a V cam. So it was just, if something was happening, I would have to get on the radio and be like, hey, so I need a camera guy over here. Something's because we didn't know what was going to go on because there's no script. This is an unscripted doc versus a narrative feature. You have a script. So you know your day to days. I know I'm going to shoot this this day. I know I'm going to shoot this this day. I know this actor is going to be here. I got stunts going on this day. I know what everybody's doing on a feature. But on this documentary, it was just the wild, wild west. It was like we didn't know what was going to happen on every day. But we made it happen. It was definitely a learning process. And Nick and I will tell anybody, if you could film a documentary, you could film anything. And you know, in some documentaries out there, their budgets are the same as feature films. Yeah, I mean... There's no difference in filming a feature film versus a documentary. It's just one scripted, one is it. And sometimes you'll have a, a scripted documentary, but ours was unscripted. And it was very challenging. It was more challenging in the post-production process on making the film. Because then we had to sift through 500 hours of footage oh. trying to make a narrative to the story. Crazy. And, it, and we started shooting that documentary during COVID. So now we have COVID. On top of all this, and during COVID, our whole industry was shut down. The whole world was shut down. But Nick and I were like, we got to do something. I just can't sit at home. I, we we got to film something. So that's where we came up with the idea of making this documentary. And we started, I think, October 1st, 2020. And we were planning on doing like a four-week shoot. We wrapped production on Halloween. That was That was our plan, to get it done before... All of our presidential elections started when everybody was going to vote in November. So we wanted to be wrapped before the elections. Well, that didn't happen. That's that's film for you. Nothing ever goes according to plan, especially with this one. It was just we just didn't know what was going on. It was just it was crazy because we would try to schedule stuff, but then there would someone throw a wrench in it and it would just something else is happening. And it you watch the show. It's just a bunch of shenanigans. And we were catching everything on film. There was no producer telling, hey, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? No, we were shooting this real time and it was just happening in front of camera. And we ended up wrapping production because of all the shenanigans that were happening. We didn't wrap until February 1st of 2021. And then we started post immediately. I don't think we had like a really good structure of the film until about May or June of 2022 is when we were actually like, okay, we pretty much got the film done. Now we can start trying to shop it. And we originally had shot that whole documentary as a uh, eight episode series. But once we got into the post production process and I started approaching sales agents and I started approaching like people that we know in the industry to try and get it in front of like Netflix or Discovery we were told that they wouldn't take it. Uh, we just finished it as eight episodes. They would not take it. Nobody would take it. Because if they were going to do an episodic series, they would want it to have been in the whole process at the beginning of the film. Because they would want some sort of creative control narratively of that show. So wow. they told us, if you can recut it into a feature, then we'll look at it. So that's what we did. But luckily how we shot it, it was very easily to cut it into a feature, but there was some stuff that we cut out that we hated that we had to cut out because yeah. I don't think anybody was going to watch a, a three hour documentary. <laughs> right. uh, 
<laughs> but it ended up being, I think, just under two hours. So, and it paces very well. There's a lot of backstory, but, you know, it, it ended up coming out really well as a, a full-fledged feature versus episodic which no regrets on that it just sucks that we had to cut a lot of stuff out that was probably june 2022 and then by july i already had distro and i did it on my own i didn't go through a sales agent at one point nick and i were really you know asking ourselves because you know we would have different cuts of the film and we would go and watch them and then we would show some friends that we would kind of get their opinions on and then we rented out a theater and did a private showing just to get some audience feedback and it was very interesting to hear people's reactions on the film because it's like in our close circle of people that we were showing it to, it seemed like we had a gold mine. Like everybody's like, this is great. Like, this is amazing. But then once we started getting it out to people, it was like, hmm. Like they said they liked it, but then it was just like, eh. And then we were like, oh, did we make a bad movie? Like, did we just waste 600 grand on a, on a movie that we think that was good? And... When we started showing sales agents that we were getting introduced to, one guy from Italy, and I'm not going to say his name because we think he's an idiot, was like, you should just cut this down to like a 30-minute episode and that'd be it. <laughs> we were like, what are you talking about? We're like, did you even watch it? Um, but it was just funny. And we told our, our other producer that introduced us to him. He was just like, wow, I, I didn't realize he would say that. You know, and then we got in front of A&E. We got in front of Paramount, you know, trying to get it on their, you know, streaming networks. And they wanted the narrative to be kind of different. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to keep the narrative of this thing really good. Only because we didn't want to paint the company in a bad light in a negative way because they are still a business. And we did not want to interfere with that. We wanted to actually, you know, maybe up their business, but also tell this incredible story at the same time. So there was kind of a, a moment there where it was just like, Nick and I just looked at ourselves and was like, what are we going to do with this? Like, are we going to be able to get it sold? I mean, that's the hardest thing in the film is if you're trying to do it on your own without big studio money is who believes in my project so I can talk them in them, give me money. Because if... I don't have the funds to do it. I need to get someone else who does. That's the hardest thing, number one. And number two is, can I sell it or license the film? And do, will people like it? That's the two hardest things in film because anybody can go out and make a movie. That's easy. But it's, can you get funds to make it? And can you get it sold so people know about it? That's the hardest thing. And so Nick and I looked at each other. I was like, what are we going to do? I was like, are we going to be able to get this thing sold and on the network or what are we going to do? And then he just looked at me and was like, dude, you're the producer. Figure it out. I'm the director. Like my producer hats off. Like, this is your thing. You figure it out. So I figured it out. I mean, I locked myself in my office and I think this was right after July 4th weekend in 2022. And I made up this generic email thing and... I started emailing every single distributor I could find. And a lot of people don't know this about me, but other than stunts and playing football, I have a side hustle where I work as a private investigator. And I've done that for 14 years now, and which is a great side hustle for, for stunts because you're not working every day doing stunts. So I do that. So I utilized my PI resources and was able to get emails, phone numbers, that a lot of people probably couldn't get. And I had all these emails to all the big agencies like UTA, um, CAA, Gersh, and I just had the direct contacts of all these people. And I just started blasting, blasting the Ark of Lilburn everywhere, just cold emailing and sending them the link to our trailer that we did. And I didn't think I would get, but maybe a 10% retention rate on my emails. Because you know when you get like weird emails, you think are junk, you just send them to junk box. Um, so I was thinking a lot of these were going to bounce back, that the emails were bad or they no longer worked there or everything was just going to the junk file or they would just look at it and be like, eh, and, and, and go on. I, I do that a lot too with people that send me scripts and I don't know who they are. I don't know if it's spam or if I open that file and then I got a virus. So it's, it's kind of hard. So, you know, I didn't think I was going to get anywhere with it. So this started on a Friday and by Monday morning, I think – my retention rate that I got was probably in the 80% range um, for people that I was getting responses back wanting to see the whole show. Wow. So they were 
they were all in it. They were hooked. They were like, we want to see the full thing, send it over. And as a producer, that's huge because a lot of times in Hollywood, you know, most of the stuff they get, they think is trash. I'm sure they get a lot of like, hey, look at this film that I made. I'm a, I'm sure they get it all the time. But ours was actually really good and it's very high quality. It's very professionally done. And the story's there. I think creatively, you can see we put our time and effort into it. And I started getting just replies from all these agencies, replies from all these distribution companies. And I end up choosing a distributor and just completely bypass the sales agent. And that's one less person I got to pay out of my cut. So that was huge. And this distributor also offered me a minimum guarantee on the film. So that's with no big actors in there. So that was huge that they offered us an MG, which is pretty good because that was telling us, all right, we must have something here. So yeah, we, we ended up getting it distributed and in December of 2022. And yeah, it's, it's been out for a little bit and it's made its rounds and we're starting to get our quarterly reports back, but we'll start seeing our big paydays probably in the next few months. So I think it's making money. So it's, yeah, we, we did our job. Good for you. I love hearing of people succeed. I love hearing of people that go out and grab it with both hands and make it happen. And it's those tests that have been, you know, in between the big paydays, the beginning of it when COVID strikes, that you was proactive enough to go out there and make something happen. And it sounds yeah. like you did a wonderful job at doing that. So hats off to you and, uh, and Nick and everyone involved. It's pretty incredible. Yeah, it was fun. You know, and at the time shooting during COVID, I mean, it was Tyler Perry in my production were the only productions filming on the East Coast. That's a multi-million dollar business. And then my little old production company. So it's pretty cool. And then now we're involved in a, a strike, you know, with the unions, with SAG and WGA. So that's completely shut everything down again. So Nick and I have been, since we wrapped the Ark of Lilburn, I've been out there trying to get funds for my slate. That's been so hard, but I finally found a guy and he's going to fund the whole slate, like a hundred million dollars. So it's pretty cool. And we're starting our next film in a couple of weeks. And this one's going to come out with a bang. I can't tell you too much about it, but it's called Vicarious. And trust me, you're going to want to see it. <laughs> What's the budget of Vicarious? Out of the uh, 15 million. Um, so we'll, we'll probably have a $10 million budget, shooting budget production, and then we'll set aside 5 million for P&A marketing. Wow. And will this be available in theaters in the US? Or where? Yes. If, if everything goes... Like we planned, yes, it will go in theaters for sure. It's going in theaters. We're going to try and aim for a July 4th, 2024 release date. But once we get closer, we'll be able to know that release date when we start shooting. Because, you know, there's different stages of film. So I know post-production will take 20 weeks easily. But yeah, that's what we're aiming for, July 4th. Will it be available to see in the UK, Vicarious? Will it be at theaters over here as well? well yeah, we'll do a worldwide release for sure. Yeah. It's going to be one of those movies that the whole world is going to want to see. Wow. Because it, it's so bold, too. And it's and it's a story I think everybody's going to be like, about damn time someone made it. <laughs> no, it sounds, from what you're saying, it, it's definitely got my attention. It sounds like, okay, let's see. Let's see what yeah. this is. It's exciting. It's, it's building it up. You know, it's oh, yeah. Up. what's the mystery? What's going on? So, no. I mean, cool. you, you've got big stuntmen now that have put out some phenomenal projects like if you're into john wick that's actually done by stuntmen it's produced by stuntmen and made by stuntman the director then you got extraction you know that's done directed by sam hargrave which you know phenomenal director phenomenal stunt guy and then you know you have uh you know david leach he's out there doing all the um the ryan Reynolds movie deadpool that's that's him bullet train i mean he's he's out there crushing it right now and jj you know just did the jamie fox movie the vampire movie you got lynn odin doing his thing i mean those are stunt guys that have come out of this realm of doing stunts and making these movies as stunt coordinators and second unit directors and now the studios are giving them chances to direct and now they're seeing that, hey, these stunt guys actually know what they're doing. You know, you can expect this movie to be of that caliber, but way better. Way better. As a producer now, what type of content are you looking for? What type of content catches your eye? 
And what is it within a screenplay that you think it needs to really hold your attention? Um, so it's really hard these days to find a script that's just really good. Like you read it and you can't put it down or you read it. And in the first, you know, 30 pages or so, you're like, hell yeah. I can get behind this. Yeah. It's hard to find that. I was told this, my line producer at the moment, his name's Mark Weinstein. He told me when he read Vicarious, he was like, I read the first few pages and knew this thing's a gold mine just by the first two pages. And once I started getting into it, it's like, I couldn't put it down. And then when I finished it, it was like, holy shit, these guys are really going to make this movie. This is very bold. So it was a really, really good script. But what I want to see in a script is a good balance of action, good characters. I, I'm all about characters, that character dynamic. And yeah, I'll know it when I read it. it it's kind of hard to say you should put this and put that in there because it's whatever the writer's feeling at the time and you know what their vision is of the script. And if I can get it behind it or if there's a, a good baseline there and we just need to tweak some stuff for the rewrite, I, I'm all about it. Uh, which what most scripts will go through several rewrites anyway. I think our vicarious, I think we're on the like maybe the twentieth rewrite next time. <laughs> so, but it's it's every rewrite it's transformed into something different because it's like we should do this, put it in there and see what we think, and it's like ah that works. And then later on we might be like we we need to change that thing we did a few weeks ago and put this new thing in and then put this right. It's just more getting the order of things together but i think i love action i love action movies but i love a good drama i think as a stuntman i want to be able to, to bring good stories to camera and what i mean by good stories like they don't have to be a lot of action i want people to know if i do an action movie that's going to be really good but it's like if you come from an action background can you make a movie that has no action in it that's just strictly character driven yes i want to do that like and so does nick nick wants to really Really, you know not have to hone in on all the action but can you tell a story like can you put it on screen and tell a story and a few movies that jump out at me is one called dark waters with uh, mark ruffalo that tells about the dupont investigation i thought that movie was amazing that movie was so great and it had zero stunts in it maybe some driving sequences i think with just driving the in a straight line but there were no stunts in that movie, but it was such a powerful movie. I love powerful movies, like true story type stuff. I love that stuff. I'll take Fast and Furious as an example. You know, the new one that's out now, they've gone to space. They've gone fucking everywhere now. And it's just, it just gets to the point where it's just like, what's realistic, you know? And I think from a, a CGI standpoint with stunts, I'm all about practical. I just think it looks way better on camera. 100%. Like if you see Top Gun, Maverick, I mean, all the practical stunts, they actually got in there and had the actors fly in the jet. I mean, from a CGI standpoint, there was always a Navy pilot in that plane that was flying that plane, not the actors, but they had a green screen behind the actor, in, you know, in front of the pilot, where it just looks like they were there, but they were actually in the plane. They were actually feeling the G-forces. They were actually doing it, which from a practicality standpoint, is amazing. And on camera, it looks phenomenal. What do you think of Tom Cruise as a stuntman? The guy does all his own stuff. Is that true? Is there more to it? And what's your opinion? So Tom Cruise is a very talented human being. Yeah. Straight up. Dude is, dude is rock solid. Yeah. Like he does a lot of his own stuff to an extent. Yes. There are some things that he doesn't do. And you can catch it in the film if you're very good on the eye with how things are cut. I mean, you can see when they're using the double and when they're using him. But he does a lot of his own stuff. Like in his new Mission Impossible movie. I mean, you could tell when they're using double when they're not using Tom. But you could tell when they're using Tom. But he gets in there and does it. Like, he's a phenomenal driver. Like, great stunt driver. And that's kind of like my thing is I stunt drive a lot and more or less get set on fire and get just beat up. That's <laughs> Those are my my crafts and stunts. Another um, day at work. <laughs> yeah, hey, hey, another day at work. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah, Tom is very talented. Yeah, he gets in there and does it. And, and most actors, you know, don't don't want to because they're like, that's why I have a double. Let him do it. I don't need to do that. But then you got other actors who are like, yeah, I want to get in there and do it. But a lot of times, you know, we have insurance on the set, you know, a bond for the film. Sometimes the insurance company won't, won't let them do certain things because 
I think it was on one of the Mission Impossible movies. Tom was doing a stunt and he broke his ankle from jumping from one building to the to to the next and broke his ankle. They shut down production for like six or eight months. From an insurance standpoint, they won't let them do a lot of things, but they will let them do some things. Yeah. But you know, it's hard to tell Tom, who's an executive producer on the movie, who has put money in the movie, and it's pretty much his movie, what to do. <laughs> But Tom does have some common sense to where he's like, yeah, I'll let him do it. But at the same time, I'm going to do it too. So it's, you know, there's some give and take with that. But, you know, Tom is very talented. He gets in and does it. Have you met him? I haven't met him, but I know a stunt double. I've met him wide a few times, but I've never met Tom. But Nick has, I think. Uh, I think Nick, I, I don't know if Nick met Tom directly, but I know he worked on a movie with Tom here in Atlanta. Who's maybe the most underrated person that you've met that is phenomenal that does not get their flowers of how great they are so you mean as like an actor or as like a human being in, itself in any aspect in any, any aspect, aspect within the entertainment industry whether a writer an actor a stunt person director someone that you was like how does nobody know how great this person is they are unbelievable they're behind yeah. so many things. Yeah, that's a hard question. Is, um, there's quite a few people that come to mind. I maybe have to throw in like Vin Diesel, only because that dude is a really, really chill guy. Like just one of the bros type of guys. He's like very, very cool. Like you think he's like very like, you know, he plays like a really like macho character on set, uh, you know, really badass but off camera dude you could just hang out with that guy and it's just like one of the bros I mean, he's very nice he trained at nick's gym when he owned a gym in atlanta nick is like a he was a professional muay thai fighter so he went in thailand and, and fought professionally and i always kid around with him that one of the first fights i looked up on him just to see if he wasn't full of it was a fight that i found that he lost he's like i don't know what fight that was he he gets real offended but he trained at nick's gym he's, he's nick was like dude he's really cool he's like he reminds me a lot of you jay and i was just like wow and then i met him and i could see yeah i could see how you could say that i mean he's just really laid back and very chill and has kids so i you know there's a, i can relate to him a lot but he's like our personalities are very light um i've met him a couple times and yeah he's he was really really nice um and there's a lot of actors out there that are really nice i remember when i worked on Acreman 2 so there was a whole like fight montage <laughs> of this crazy fight <laughs> and we, were, and we were filming it in in downtown atlanta in this park and i remember before we would get to set all the stunt guys would go put their bags kind of where our where our area was on set and the director of that film his name slips my mind but he would always have the god speaker on so he would always talk through the speaker to give the actors direction and what was cool how he shot was that they never stopped rolling through takes so if they were in a scene and keep in mind this is a comedy so he would just say they would be the end of the scene here that why don't you say this and then they would start again and it would still roll you would never stop rolling and just seeing them go back and back and forth through that was comical. Yes. But it brings my point to there was a day when we came out and Kanye West was doing a montage in this fight. So he was out there. Kim Kardashian was there. But this was before the crew was out there and everybody and the director. And so Kanye's on the God speaker rapping one of the songs just straight out so everybody could hear it. It was so funny. Like he's rapping to his own songs and there's just this little bitty crowd of people around him as he was rapping. I think it, it may have been some extras, but then you have in this part, this was like during the early morning rush hour. So there's, there's people out there trying to get to work and there's a college right there, Georgia state. So everybody's just like, what the fuck's going on? And just Kanye rapping. And I don't think a lot of people knew it was Kanye, but he was such a funny guy, like talking to him. He's like really funny and he's really, really smart. Yeah. And I think a lot of people clowned him on that show. And they said he was a real big drama queen because when they rapped him that day and he got in the, in the transpo van and they, and, he, and he's going off set, everybody clapped and applauded and was like, yes, he's gone. Ah! Which I thought was hilarious at the same time. And then when I talked to him, I was like, he was actually very nice. I thought he was cool. It's crazy how people can share different opinions on someone. They could be loved. Yeah. 
we all loathed in like the same breath. We could both say the same thing. I could love him. You could hate him. It's crazy. Oh yeah. There were so many stars that had montages on that, on that film. Like a lot of people I would never thought I would have met like Jim Carrey. He takes my eye out in that scene with a hockey stick and you can see how they set up that shot in like the bonus footage of the DVD. They put like this real goat eye on the tip end of the stick. So I'm off camera. He takes the stick and he's like, ah! and it's taking everything you have in me not to laugh and not to, you know, break character where it messes up with him. <laughs> but it's just so funny. And yeah. then you just see these other characters. I mean, you got Liam Neeson was there and I was talking to him and I was like, this is crazy. Like I'm talking to Liam Neeson and, you know, I'm talking to Jim Carrey and then it's like, there's Kirsten Dunst over there. And then there's Kanye West with M Kardashian. And then you got Will Ferrell and, you know, I doubled Will on that show a little bit. And I played a cameo as well. I was part of the the entertainment news team. Nick and I were actually. So if you see the montage, we come in on a doom buggy. Nick's driving and I'm straddling the doom buggy with Amy Poehler right here and Tina Fey right here. Oh, man. Those two girls are hilarious. They're so funny. And we were just shooting the shit with them. It's it's funny just to shoot the shit with these actors and talk about just random things. And, you know, Paul Rudd's a really, really nice guy. Hands down, probably one of the coolest actors I've met. He's just really nice. All those actors are pretty nice on that show. Will was just, he's just over the top funny. And just like he is in person. It's cool to kind of rub elbows with some of these actors. Oh, that's epic, that is. In terms of the stunt work, what's the art to the stunt work? What's the art to the craft? Is it practice? Is it dependent on situation? Is it bringing in specialists which would understand how that would work? What is the art to it? Because I'm sure over your 17 years, you've improved naturally like anything anyone would do for 17 years. What would you bring it down to is this is the art of stunt work. This is what, if you're just starting out, you won't quite get it. But when you're, yeah. when you're seasoned in the game, you get it that this is what you're looking for. That's a season stunt, man. What is it? So I think it comes down to, you know, as a stunt performer, performers have many backgrounds, like mine's in football. So I'm very used to, you know, getting hit, giving hits, and just getting beat up. So I'm used to that. And that comes hand in hand with stunts, you know, having to, you know, to take a tackle or take a fall, which is huge, and, and it not look weird or get yourself hurt. But then you have martial artists who that's all they do is they've done martial arts their whole life. But then you got to take that art form of martial arts and how you've learned it and transform that into what that would look like on camera. And there's right and wrong ways on how to throw a punch on camera as you would normally doing martial arts. It's, it's a totally different art form. And the same way goes with driving cars. You might have guys that come from a background of being a mechanic or race car car driver or just street racing just being around cars their whole lives and those come hand in hand with stuff you would need to know on set and then you got people that are gymnasts they're not necessarily martial artists but a lot of really big you know stuntmen are former gymnasts and high divers in college so you got a lot of college athletes and and a lot of martial arts gymnasts and athletes from all various different sports and military guys because a lot of weapon stuff in movies now it really comes down to what the director wants as far as how he wants the movements to work and i think you know as far as nailing down the art form of stunts it just comes down to what your craft is and what you've trained to do and what you're comfortable doing because a big problem we have in stunts is you don't work a lot you don't work all the time you work for a coordinator and they might be a part of stunts unlimited which is you know these groups in hollywood that are just known for stunt drivers which is stunts unlimited and then you have fight guys that's all they're known for and that's 87 11 out of la and then you have kind of a mixture of motorcycle riders and BMX guys and, you know, drivers as well. And they're brand X. And then you have the fire guys, which all they do is fire burns and ratchets and rigging. And you have that with action factory. And then you have guys that are affiliated with 
a little bit of everything, which is Stunts Unlimited and Brand X and ISS, which is your International Stuntmen Association. Then you have the Stuntmen's Association. So there's several groups of stunts where Hollywood seeks out to hire the specific needs of the film. And then you might get involved with these cliques and then they hire you one time and you did a good job and you start getting to hire it again and again and again and again. And then you're just training on doing what you need to do for for that film whether it's a driving movie with a lot of driving you're gonna hire a lot of the drivers that are really really good at that craft but a lot of guys like i said will you don't work a lot so they may say they can do something but they really can't just because they need the work and they need the money which should come around and and will bite you in the butt later on because the stunt community is so small that everybody knows everybody pretty much. And a lot of the big time stunt coordinators and, and stuntmen in the industry, it's all been kept in the family. So it's all been brought down generation after generation and then passed along to their kids and their family. So it's it's really tight knit clicks and those people generally get first priority in all the work. And then you'll hire guys that get recommended by other people, which is networking's huge and stunt. So it's kind of the out of sight, out of mind type type thing. So if you're not relevant, nobody's going to know who you are. So, and you won't make it in the industry as a stuntman. So a lot of it comes hand in hand on who you know, which is pretty much everything in our industry and in the world as a job. It's all about who you know. <laughs> and it is. Um, yeah. But I think the art of a stuntman or stunt woman comes down to what your craft is. It's, if you're a fight guy, you know, you train that. I mean, if you're a fire guy, you're trained fire. If you're a rigger, you're doing all the rigging stuff. If you're a car guy, you're doing all the driving stuff. And if you're a little bit of everything, you're an all around stunt guy, you'll just train a little bit of everything. It's kind of like me. I'm I'm a little bit of, you know, well-versed because I'm an athlete, but I don't claim to be a fight guy. I'm not going to go in there and do all martial artsy John Wick stuff. I'm just like, that is, that's just not me. I'm a six foot two, 225 pound football player. I ain't get out there swinging my leg kicking someone making it look all artsy because i never trained to do it so i mean it's 100%. but i can but i can react to that and, and make it look like i'm getting my ass whooped, yeah, which yeah. i can do that so and that's what i do so i think it just comes down to whatever your craft is and you're training that craft and you're trying to be the best at that will send you a long way in the industry and you can have a very lengthy career yeah. in doing that. Does it pay well? Yeah, stunts pays extremely well. So we are in the union of the Screen Actors Guild. So there is a minimum we get paid. I think, if, you know, our contract's getting negotiated right now. So I think we... It breaks down to, I think we get paid $138 an hour, but we get paid like $1,083 a day plus OT, which normally on a film set, you're going to get OT because nobody's ever in a hurry on the big movies, regardless of the movie, <laughs> which it comes to my point earlier. They just waste money. They waste so much money. But then you'll get what's called a stunt adjustment, which for whatever stunt you're performing that day, whether you're on camera doing the featured stunt or on camera, but kind of in the background doing other stuff, or you're just in harm's way protecting extras. You're kind of like that barrier between all the crazy shit that's happening. That stunt adjustment will vary on what you're doing. Like my highest ever stunt adjustment, I think was like $10,000 for doing a stunt. So I got 10,000 tacked on to my daily that day. So I ended up making like 15 grand in one day. So which is not bad, but then you'll have different, you know, pay structures if you're on a weekly contract versus a daily contract versus a three day contract. So, and then if you're a big time stuntman doubling a big time actor and you've doubled them a lot, the actor might have you on a contract with them and then they might be paying you double, triple, or quadruple scale, which that in terms, you might be making three to $5,000 a day plus adjustments, plus OT and plus all the bells and whistles. So you can make a good career at being a stuntman i know some of the top performers they'll make seven figures easily and stunt coordinators i mean just depends on you know what you're doing on how often you're working on the shows per year but you can make a very good living doing stunts and it comes with good insurance we have insurance through our union but we have to make a certain amount of money each year to qualify for the sag pension help yeah i mean it comes with full medical benefits and it's really good health insurance that's one of the major things with stunts is more or less the healthcare and 
and yeah, I mean, you can make a pretty good career out of it. I mean, you can definitely support your family, but the thing of it is, that's just in the United States. So once you drift outside the U.S., everything's non-union. Then you're having to negotiate your rates with whatever production you're on. Like the last time I worked out of the country was in, I think it was 20, 2021, might have been 2022, in Budapest. I worked on a film over there on Slick Shot that I was producing and stunt coordinating. When I did my budget for stunts, I did it based on I was just going to pay SAG rates because I didn't know the minimums over there in Budapest until I hired a Hungarian coordinator and he told me the rates and I was like wow I was paying everybody way too much but I made up because you know I have to get everything approved they wouldn't let me bring over um U.S. stuntmen for for reasons as it's expensive because they're union workers so I have to fly them first class I have to put them up in a fancy hotel I have to pay them per diem I've got to pay them a lot of money so that's a it's a big cost versus using someone local. You know, our cost was a thousand eighty three per day as a union stunt performer in Budapest. I think their pay was like two seventy five a day. So that's a huge gap difference from four times difference. It's a big yeah. Big so difference. it's 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 huge. Crazy. But with that comes with you know the professionals from Hollywood, but. You know, when you're doing other films from, you know, in other countries, you know, we don't know how their stunt departments are because they were really focused on safety with stunts. So it's there's been a lot of deaths in our industry here lately that really shouldn't have happened. So when I was in Budapest, I was there more for safety because I was the supervising stunt coordinator. Because when you have union actors um, on a non-union show out of the country, the union actors are going to want a qualified stunt coordinator on set from the U.S. just to make sure everything's on the up and up yeah. with the local coordinators. Because filming outside the U.S., a lot of people call it the wild, wild west. They try and get by on a lot of things the producers try and you know skim on a lot of things because it's all about saving not just spending money so to speak when you should be spending money they're just trying to a put more money in their pocket or b you know just trying to be cheap which is what happened on that set of rust with alec baldwin which that's pure shenanigans and shouldn't have happened so i mean it's and that's what happens you you get shit like that that happens so it's someone loses their life that shouldn't have because it shouldn't have never happened. And that's why you need qualified stunt professionals on set to have the, you know, the resume and the experience to back it up. And, you know, I always tell everybody stunts is it's it's really easy, but it's it requires a lot of common sense. But a lot of people, unfortunately, don't have a lot of common sense. So it's like, oh, you know, <laughs> What do you do? I think you're doing it in the perfect way. And I think that listening to you, the way you've approached your craft and continue to approach it and what you're going now into in this producing journey and what you've done with this documentary and the resilience and the perseverance to get that to where it is. They're the pieces that people miss, that it takes dedication and it takes a relentlessness to get to where you want to. Yeah. And with, with that said, Jay, is there anything final that you want to add in this episode today? Is there anything that you want to share before we... <laughs> I mean, I've got my project coming out. We're about to start. So, you know, Vicarious. So definitely keep a lookout for that. But you can go and kind of keep progress of my stuff on noblefilms.com. Um, I keep my projects on there. And you can actually go and watch the documentary on there as well. I got links up on there. And you can follow me on IMDb. You can see all my resume on there. Jay, very, very, very talented man. Very unique in your journey, but makes perfect sense. Brother, it's been such a, an honor to speak with you. And for everybody, keep your eyes out for Vicarious. It sounds very interesting. I don't even know what it is yet, but it sounds <laughs> great. And I can't wait to see it, you know, seeing what this gentleman and his partner, Nick, um, in business are now going to go on to achieve. So this is going to be so cool. When you have him on here, ask Nick about Vicarious. He may give you more about yeah. it than I will, but... Yes, I don't want to leak too much out, but you already know what it's somewhat about. But uh, <laughs> if I give it away, people are going to go nuts. I can't do it. <laughs> well, listen, to everybody, I hope you've enjoyed another fantastic episode. Stay great and be seen.